If that wasn't enough, I got my top ten. Oh boy. I did my homework. So, top ten pickup lines from the Bible. Now I know why Solomon had 700 wives, because he never met you. <laughs> How many times do I have to walk around you, babe, for you to fall for me? <laughs> Would you like to join my purpose-driven life? <laughs> I believe you're one of my ribs, and you belong to me. If I were around Noah, then you and me would equal. Okay. So last night I was reading the book of Numbers, and then I realized I don't have yours. <laughs> Is your name faith? Because you're the substance of things I hope for. <laughs> I did actually think of some things. <laughs> I didn't believe in predestination until I met you. I just want you to know, I'm praying for you. Baby, I'm praying for you. <laughs> I didn't know angels flew this low. You must be heaven on earth. <laughs> for an old guy who hasn't dated for 36 years, not bad. Not bad. No. Anyway, relationships. Dangerous waters. All month, we're going to talk about it in different ways. We have Dave Weiss coming. He, Dave is going to do a whole bunch of paintings and stuff and interact with us in a couple weeks. We have Gordon who's going to come and talk about the things that you need to say before I say I do. From a comedy standpoint, we are going to have several goals this month. Goal number one, we want to have fun with this. There's too many times that church people get weird when it comes to dating. We want to make it enjoyable. We want to talk about relationships. And if you are already married, you still need to be dating your spouse. Second thing I want us to draw out of this. I want you to have a better understanding of who you are in God. Because if you're comfortable in your own skin, you're going to be much more comfortable in building a relationship with somebody else. And last but not least, we're going to do a movie night later this month. The title? Uh... Sin's Guide to Dysfunctional Romance. <laughs> and that is the title of our entire month. The Cynic's Guide to Dysfunctional Romance. You're, you're welcome. Because <laughs> all of us, we came, up, we came up with it together. Why? Yeah. Because many of us are horrible at it. And we need help and encouragement. <laughs> so today, we're going to start with the guys. We're doomed. Ladies, take notes. We'll get to you at the end of the month. Why? Because it'll be so much shorter? Yes. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> no, but because guys need to hear it. Because you don't want to get stuff thrown at you. <laughs> Listen, authentic manhood, there's a lot that's been said in the last 25 years. You know, there's been the bang the drum slowly guys to sit around the campfire and pass the, you know, the big stick, whoever is the stick can speak, and we try to draw it out of ourselves and become manly men and all that kind of nonsense. Listen, we just need to get into the Word and see what the Word says. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. Before King David, on his deathbed, gets to Solomon, Solomon, please take out these two guys who've done me wrong after I'm gone. He gives Solomon some really sound advice. So if you ignore the second half of this passage where he's talking about so-and-so did me wrong, wipe him out. I mean, let's talk about the real stuff. 1 Kings 2, beginning in the very first verse, as David's time to die drew near. He charged, charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep charge 
of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. So the Lord may carry out his promises, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Does that sound like a verse that our Lord quoted? Jesus said, Greatness, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your, and your neighbor as yourself. David is giving the prime directive there. And there's some things that I want you to look from, guys and ladies, because this is these principles apply to ladies as well as guys. Biblical manliness or womanhood is concerned about the inner man, our heart. Biblical manliness or womanhood involves our character. Biblical manliness or womanhood involves our spiritual maturity. Biblical manliness, manliness or womanhood involves our sanctification. God spoke to Samuel when he was going to anoint David to be that boy king. And God said to him, God looks upon the inward man, not at the outside. Now listen, I know many of you have issues. Issues that keep women from being attracted to you. Okay? Here's my advice. Get a dog. <laughs> They'll be much more forgiving if you have a cute puppy. Okay? I'm just saying. Huh? And you'll get girls. Okay? I'm just saying. Get a dog. For those get outward idiosyncrasies, those weird things that you have, whether you don't blow your nose, wipe your nose, or your, whether your, your apartment or your truck it or your car is a train wreck inside, or whether you laugh too much or laugh too weird, or you tell, you get, get tangents or whatever it is, get a dog. I'm just saying. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, as all single guys laugh. However, excuse me. However, all that being said, if you focus on the inward man and you get into the Word of God and you get a hold of His principles and you get a hold of the Spirit of God, He will start changing you on the inside. That eventually will start oozing out on the outside. You see, it's about, you want to be a, a great man? You want, you want to be able to lead your home one day? You want to have a home? Get into the Word of God. And allow the Spirit of God to get a hold of your heart and change you. And guess what? In time, you will become very attractive to ladies. But it starts on the inside. There's no special recipe. I am the product of a young man who had his, his future wife say no five times. And the third time my wife said to me, grow up, and then I might consider you. She actually said that to me. You know what happened to me? I went home and cried like a baby. I was hooked. I was in love with her. It drove me to my knees. It drove me to pray. It drove me to start hanging out and looking at who am I hanging out with? Am I hanging out with men who are going to invest in me and speak into my life and tell me where I needed to change? It drove me to have mentors. It drove me to get into the Word. It drove me to actually go to my professor's office at 10 o'clock at night and listen to him on his little saddle horse. Ed Eidelman used to have this cool, he had this really fancy saw horse, and he had his rodeo saddle on it. And he would sit on this rodeo saddle and drink out of a little teacup hot chocolate. And we would sit there at 10 o'clock at night and talk about Jesus stuff. And he would tell me what a butthead I was and the stupid thing in my life. And you think she said, by the way, she was the nanny to his kids. So he had to legit, I figured, if she's working for him, I'm going to go. She was a professor of Greek. 
and languages. And I was horrible at that subject. You know? And he spoke into my life and it changed me. It changed me. You need, if you're going to mature, you need to get into the Word of God. You need to grow. Real manliness, mature manhood, Ephesians 4, is defined by Christ-like character. Not just the gentle Jesus, meek and mild style character, but a full-orbed fruit of the Spirit, rounded out in strength, courage, conviction, a stout-hearted willingness to expose error, fight for truth, even to the point of laying down your life for truth if necessary. You need to come to a Jesus moment in your life, gentlemen, where you have a knock them out, drag them out, come to Jesus, I'm changing or dying. If you have that moment, you will never be the same again. You give into the Spirit of God, I'm telling you something, God will use you in a mighty way. When the Apostle Paul writes about the characters, characteristics of true Christian manhood in Ephesians 4, he focuses on one vital mark of spiritual maturity. It, quote, that we no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You want to be a man who is opposed, uh, is opposed to a little boy? Grow up in your grasp of truth. Get a grip on sound doctrine. Quit being influenced by every friend and every fad and every wackadoodle idea that you come across. Quit chasing the evangelical fats. Get anchored in the truth and be prepared to defend it. That's a mark of true manhood. You start with the Word of God. You start with hiding the Word of God in your heart. You start with memorizing Scripture. You start getting into the doctrines of the Scripture. Get into sanctification. Get into, get into understanding what the blessings and the promises are of God and start living it. I'm telling you, you couldn't beat off the women who would chase after you with a stick. Why? Because you're rare. My greatest issue that I've had as a pastor in the last 30 years is most men are spineless whips spiritually. They couldn't lead their way out of a wet paper bag. They don't know how to stand for truth. And when it comes to standing for truth, when you do stand for truth, guess what you find yourself? You're alone. Because nobody else has courage to face truth. We need a generation of men that are men, that are biblical. Paul singles out doctrinal stability. Along with that, there are some clear implications. You need to be certain of what you believe. You need to understand it. You need to be able to defend it against everything. Ranging from changing winds of whatever happens in the style of the moment to all the way to human trickery and cunningness of, of craftiness of Satan himself. Because the enemy will offer all kinds of counterfeit doctrines out there that look okay, that sound okay, these false doctrines, you need to understand and how to deliver yourself from them. Here's the problem. What I'm proposing is hard work. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience. It's going to take a lot of nights that are sleepless. <laughs> Hebrews 5 says this, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you, you have the need that one teach you again which are the first principles of the oracles of God, have become such, have meat for milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them who are full age, even those by the reason who have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When it comes to understanding and developing character, when we do that, when we grow in our understanding, if we grow in developing our character, we can become leaders. And I'm not talking about you become a pastor. I'm talking about that at some level, you can lead something in a church. 
At some level, you can be a leader in the community. At some level, you can absolutely lead your home. I'm telling you what will change you. Some of you guys, you know what will change you? Having kids. Because all of a sudden, you're going to see the best and worst in every kid represents, you'll see a mixture of both spousal units. You'll see the good and the bad. And when, the, when you see the bad coming up, you will have that oh my God moment. He or she is just like me. That I see from my Uncle Bernie. That I see from my mom. That stops now. It gets you to your knees and say, God, please don't, can't, please let this pass over another generation. This cannot continue on. Whatever the sin, whatever the issue is, it'll change you. But I'm telling you, it will also overwhelm you. What do women want in a guy? Ladies, I'm going to bat for you now. Sanity. I, I, hold your words. I actually got seven issues that women want to see in men. I got this from a secular source, but I also have been checking this out for years. You know what the number one thing women want? Security. Absolutely dead on the number one thing women want. You know what they want in security? Are you stable? Are you mature? Are you hardworking? Do you have a job? Are you trustworthy? Are you able to lead on some level, including her? Are you able to stand up and have a conversation and go toe-to-toe -to -toe about serious things? See, you know how to have a serious conversation over serious things? It's very sexy. It's downright attractive. So what do women want? They want honesty. Without too much of it. <laughs> okay. there, there are some things of honesty that you pick up. The reason why, the, the, the downside of the fact the newspaper business isn't quite what it used to be, you have less to hide behind, okay? I remember for, for years, my mom would come out and ask my dad a serious question, and you'd hear the rumble, rumble, rumble of newspaper, and the paper would go like this, and he would talk from behind it. Why? Because he did not want to make eye contact, and he taught his son well, if you make eye contact, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to clothing, how does this make me look? How does my hair look? You say, you look oh, great. you're wonderful, you're beautiful. <laughs> You don't give an opinion. Your opinion does not matter. No, I'm not taking your questions. It's not a question. Jason actually tells me. Because I'd rather know if I look dumb than actually go out looking dumb. But you can't you see, like you look You see, they have, women have the right to tell us that plaid and stripes do not go together. It's okay for them to dress you, but you're not allowed to dress that. Just saying. Just saying. Second thing, understanding. What's the number one thing that you need to do in a relationship to grow a relationship? Let's Communication. You need understanding. You need to be able to talk. You need to be able to have a... Listen, one of the first things that I teach couples in premarital counseling is how to have a fight. Seriously. Because you're going to have one. Everybody fights. Don't we? I mean, every, to some degree. You have words. You have disagreements. You have levels of pain when it comes to arguing. You need to know when to hold them and know when to show them. And know when to fold them and walk away. I'm just telling you. You need that in your life. But every woman wants understanding. She needs to know that you're listening. She needs to know that you understand where she's coming from. I'm telling you, if you're in a marriage at any length of time, your best friend will become your spouse. Some of the greatest counsel I have ever had is from the lady sitting down there in front of me. Third thing every woman wants is caring. She, know, she needs to know that you, she matters to you. Men, you ca at some point in time, most guys grow up around age 30. They finally figure out what they want to do in life. Most women grow up about 17 and they know what they want out of life. You know, most men take another 10 years. 
Uh, here's the problem with most men. There's a 10-year-old little boy inside trapped who wants to get out. That's okay when you're 10 years old, but when you're 45 years old, it's not healthy. Because here's what it breeds. It breeds selfishness. You cannot, gentlemen, afford to be narcissistic around you, ladies. You need to care about what's going on in her world and what's going around in the world that you're building together. Fourth thing, strength, both mental and physical. Women want someone who has, who has mental capacity. No, nobody wants to be known as being married to a turnip. I mean, come on, really. I mean, nobody wants that. Gentlemen, strengthen your mental capacity. You're being very good at it, by the way. I have a lot of experience in this whole thing, so you know, I, I, I'm I, just being vocal. <laughs> but strength matters. Being able to hold a conversation. You know, too many couples shut down at some point in time and don't talk. It's also helpful if you're tall and you can get stuff off the top shelf. <laughs> Yeah. Why I don't I love shopping, but I hate shopping. I do I love grocery shopping. I just I love cooking. It's, one of my outlets is a guy something that she makes phenomenal desserts. The entree I usually make. Why? Because we have discovered that number one, she doesn't care for cooking like I do. It's an outlet, it's a stress buster for me. There's something about after dealing with people all day long, having a large knife and a chopping board going choppy, 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 as I'm thinking through choppy, 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 choppy. It's just, it's rather stress busting, relieving, and relaxing, and, and just saying. Fifth thing compassion. This is where, if you don't have compassion, the puppy helps. It just does. If you have a cute little puppy and you're in the park playing puppy with a frisbee, automatically she's going to assume you have compassion. It helps you. Playing puppy with a frisbee, it'd be like having a frisbee on a leash. Okay, you're in the park. Playing with your praying your frisbee and the dog. Okay. Anyway, what I'm saying is it gives you sort of a head start. It helps helps her know that there's at least the potential of you caring about something. Yes, she will. Yes. But compassion. It shows her you're capable of loving. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about serving the world, number one, Jesus said, love your neighbor, okay? But this compassion about serving the world, it's learned. If you gentlemen don't know how to love and be, have compassion, get involved in ministry that is meeting the needs of the poor. Get involved in ministry that's helping hurting people or elderly people. I'm telling you, God will stretch you and help you develop the ability to care. I came out of the corporate world. What did people care about? Most of them were megalomaniacs who were, who were narcissistic, who only cared about the accumulation of their own personal toys and wealth. You know, I met pastors the same way. You get out and serve people, nothing will change you more than a little kid coming up to you saying thank you. It'll change you. Sixth thing, Here, here's the biggie. Security, both financial and literal. Women want security. They need. The worst thing that I have had to deal with in counseling any couple is when he has violated her security. You need to learn how to provide and be secure. Last one. Of course, the page sticks together. Another tough one. Blind loyalty. 
when you say I do, that's it. There's no, I'm not sure, even if you're not sure. There's no, what have I done? What have I gotten myself into? It's done. You want, you want her to change? Tell, I'm, I'm telling you what I tell most women when they're frustrated with their husband. I, first question I ask, have you prayed into him? You want to see, ladies, you want to see him change? Pray for him. Say, Father God, I know you love me very much. Do what is ever necessary to change that. To be very specific. Guess what? God will work in his life in that issue. Sorry, guys. I want good homes in this church. You need to have blind loyalty. You need to be trustworthy. Listen, we all have moments. We all have the tinsel distraction. It happens. You're out, you're shopping, and you go, you learn to outsmart yourself. Why do I sit with, sit, why do I sit in any restaurant with my back to the room? I mean, the other way. Why do I sit where I sit? I want to see the temptations that's coming so I can avoid them. I also want to see the people that are coming, just in case. I have this problem. No matter where I go, as my children would, would admit, I run into people. Do I? Have we ever been anywhere that we haven't seen somebody that we've known at some I've known at some point in time? Yeah, pretty much. Now here's what happens. I get this all the time. <coughs> Pastor Chuck snubbed me at Tom Jones. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's 10:30 at night. Christy and I are gonna have gonna go have pancakes. He's gonna have chocolate ice cream with sprinkles. You know, and I'm gonna have a piece of pie. You know, we're focusing on the pie at 10:30 at night, whatever. <laughs> Love Lauren thing that he wants to talk to me about. You know, we're going to go, we're going to hang out. I'm sorry, there's 400 people in the room and I can't see everybody. But here's the thing I've learned. I have to either sit where I see everybody or I make, I stop and make mental note and look around the room and go say, hey, how are you doing? Before I go sit down and make a pot. Well, it's the same way with temptation. You've got to find yourself so you can see it coming. Because if you can see it coming, you can avoid it. You just do it. Trustworthiness, blind loyalty, you need to learn to be all in. And here's the cuss word that I'm going to drop on you. Commitment. Gentlemen, you need to become committed. First to Christ our Savior. If you are not all in in your study, have I got a plan for you? We have a new, we have a new program that is available. All I need is your email. It's called Right Now Media. It has, if you don't think I'm a great Bible teacher, it's okay. I have access to all of them, every single one of them, all the great ones. And they're videos, and they're study guides. I have over 9,000 videos available now. If you're, if you're a, family, a family with small children, I've got 1,000 Christian cartoons. And guess what? It's all free. You get your email, you log in, and you can study at your own pace. If you don't like being in a room in a small group, which I really encourage, we need small groups to grow, where you have the interaction with people, if you're just not comfortable doing that at this stage of your development, you can study at your own pace online. You can be the little hermit in the woods with your little iPad. But I'm telling you, there is no excuse for not growing anymore. You want to grow? We can get you the material to grow. We can get you into the Word. You need to make a commitment to grow. Ladies, you need to do the same thing. You don't get off scot-free. Second Timothy says this, verse 2, Remind them of these things, to solemnly charge them in the presence of God, hello, I just did, to not wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as workmen, who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Paul said, charge him. I just did. Get in the word. Grow. Get in the word of God, and it will change your life. You want to do it on your own? I can help you with that. You want a personal mentor? We can help you with that. You want to get in a small group? We can help you with that. But we can help you do this. Commitment. Gentlemen, we need to change. 
need to change. We need to become biblical men. Let's pray. Father God, change us. Put the desire within us to get into your word and grow and become the men of God that you desire us to be. May our friends, may the ladies in our lives, may our parents all give us grace and mercy to change. Give us the grace space to become these people that you desire us to be. Help us to study, to show ourselves approved. Help us to have answers. Help us to have strength. Help us to be able to provide a, a, an environment of security. Help us to become the men and also the women of faith that you desire us to be. Thank you.